A few years ago, I walked into the kitchen at my house, and I discovered my then 10-year-old daughter, and she had basically set up what looked like a chemistry lab in our kitchen. She was taking notes, and I said to her, what are you doing? And she looked at me, and she said, Dad, I'm making slime. And I said, okay. And I thought to myself, what is it about young people, about children, that drives them to, to discover and explore in this way? And then I thought, do we maintain that into adulthood? And so I'd like to introduce you to a man named George de Mistral. Now, George de Mistral was a Swiss engineer. He was born in 1907, and he was an, an unusual kid. By the time he was 12 years old, he had invented a toy airplane, and he patented it. So this was not your average young man. But one day, George, when he was in his 40s, he was walking through the, the, the mountains with his dog. And as they walked along through the mountains, he began to see that his dog was getting these burrs in its fur. And he became really interested in this. And, and when he got home, he began to try to take them out of the fur. And what he discovered is that they had these little hooks in them that fit perfectly into the hair. So they would catch on the hair. And he took them into, he had a, a microscope. He took them into his, his studio and he looked at them under a microscope and he discovered the shape and the form of it. And he spent the next 10 years trying to recreate this in the lab. And of course, what he invented eventually became Velcro. And I thought to myself, what is it about this kind of person? There's something special there, some essence that is purely human. And the next thing I came across, which, which kind of you know, interested me even more in this, was I discovered that Leonardo da Vinci had a to-do list. Now, the number one thing on Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's to-do list is to ask about the measurement of the sun promised by Maestro Giovanni Francese. Now, that's quite a to-do list, right? My to-do lists are way more boring than Leonardo da Vinci's. But there's something about this kind of person. What is it that makes these people so powerful? There's, there's some special quality. You know, it's almost like we think of them as being superheroes, these innovators who, who, who change the world. But is it really something that they have that we don't have? What is that thing? I believe that that thing, that essence of being human, is our curiosity. Curiosity is something that is particularly human. All animals possess curiosity to some form or another. But there's a particular kind of curiosity that only human beings possess. It's called epistemic curiosity. And epistemic curiosity is the search for knowledge. And so if we look at curiosity, it's, it is really at the heart of what it means to be human. It's what has, has distinguished us on this planet from the rest of the species, from the rest of the animal and plant kingdom. And I think it's like a muscle. It's something that we need to exercise. We need to stretch it. it we need to make it more agile and flexible. But if we do, it allows us to explore. It makes us ask questions. It demands of us flexibility and experimentation. It allows us to relate different ideas together and to gather information and knowledge. And finally, what is most interesting about curiosity is that it requires action. Now, I'd like to, to, you to think of, of the human species, Homo sapiens, like a superhero. Because if you think of our little blue planet, we are essentially like the superheroes of our little planet. And you know that all superheroes have a superpower, right? So our superpower is our curiosity. But like all superheroes who have superpowers, all, superpower, all superheroes also have weaknesses. And what's the weakness of the human superhero? Our weakness is our insatiability. Insatiability in the sense that we have an insatiable appetite for consumption. And so if we look at these two things, our curiosity 
and our insatiable appetite, what we see is that those two things often work together, but they also can be in conflict. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, let's look at early human beings to understand why do we possess this curiosity. Early Homo sapiens were not a particularly formidable creature. In fact, if you put a, a, an early Homo sapien against a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee would tear the Homo sapien limb from limb. But what Homo, what, what Homo sapiens did was we began to gather information and knowledge. And our ability to gather information and knowledge and put that information and knowledge to use in order to survive is what allowed us to survive within the animal kingdom. Now, curiosity in human beings is, is stoked or sparked by different factors. When we face something new, our curiosity is sparked. When we have a desire or a want that is not met, it sparks our curiosity. When we find ourselves in an unexpected situation, we become curious about it. And finally, when we're faced with a threat. So there's a part of our brain which is very unique to human beings in this sense. It's called the caudate nucleus. And it's, this, it's the place in our brain that essentially does sort of the deep processing. It's also our reward center. And what's fascinating is that when human beings are faced with, with threats or unexpected situations and we become curious, our caudate nucleus hits us with little shots of dopamine, right? It's, it, which is like a pleasure drug. So we are re rewarded for being curious. So if you've ever had that experience, and I'm sure that all of you had, I have, I have as well, of sitting down um, with Instagram or TikTok and you flip, 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 flip from video to video, what's happening is that your brain is giving you little hits of dopamine. And so it's rewarding you even though you're not actually learning anything new. And so that becomes a problem in the, the state of human beings and how we use technology and our opportunity to do things which we can actually learn from. We can gain deeper knowledge. So curiosity is essentially a motivated desire for information. We are informivores. It's what feeds us as human beings, and it's what allows us to survive. Now, I mentioned Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein, when he was born, he, didn't, he wasn't born with the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics in his brain, right? When we're born, the world is unknown to us, right? And slowly, as we grow, and as Albert Einstein grew, he began to gather knowledge. And when we gather knowledge, we also become aware of the unknowns. That is to say, that I know certain things, but I become aware of the things that I don't know. Now, an incurious person will gather knowledge and information, but they begin to to, to believe, to, to, to live under the false belief that they know everything. So they have this perception that they know a lot and that the unknowns is a very small area. The curious person has what they know, but a curious person understands that what they don't know is much, much, uh, a much more, a more vast, a, a greater area. But they also have an interesting third area, which we can call the unknown unknowns. I know certain things, and then there are things that I know that I don't know. But then there's this entire world out there that I'm not even aware of. And that is where exploration, discovery, all takes place. And it's special kinds of people who venture into that area but we all have the capacity to do it if we are aware of it and we accept that those unknown unknowns exist. Now, we've talked about what makes us curious and what we do with curiosity, but there are also certain blocks to curiosity, and those are very important. The first block to curiosity is our environment. Now, young people can be taught 
to ask questions, but young people can also be taught to give answers. And so I'm sure that many of you have experienced situations where you are expected to memorize something and learn something and give the correct answer, right? You can see that that limits our curiosity, right? Whereas if we're given an, an environment where we are expected to explore and to ask questions, what happens is we stoke our curiosity. The second area is assumptions. And assumptions can be things, very basic things. This is the way we've always done things, right? And so why change? Why fix it if it ain't broke? The third area is our fear. And it's the fear of the unknown, which I think is a very natural response to the unknown. But the fourth area is the area, to me, which is giving me the greatest concern. And that is technology. Now, it's interesting because I think that we assume that technology is the great problem solver. But technology also has a difficulty. And that is that the more that we use technology, the more that we believe that there are definitive answers to our questions. Think about it. We now believe that everything is searchable. So every time that I have a question, all I have to do is sit down and search for it, and I will receive the definitive answer. So Amit Singhal, who's the Google head of research, made a really interesting statement. He said that the more accurate the machine becomes, the lazier the questions. Now think about that. Artificial intelligence is growing. And we have, you basically have at your fingertips all the information and knowledge that the human race has gathered, right, at your fingertips. But what happens is that that's actually making us lazier. So our questions are becoming less curious. Now, we have this powerful illusion that all questions have definitive and definite answers. But... There is one question that you will never find the answer to on Google. Do you know what that question is? The answer is that it is a question that has never been asked before. Now think about how powerful that is. Human beings, our curiosity is, the, is essentially the last frontier against artificial intelligence. Because we are still capable of asking questions that have never been asked before. And that is specifically where our discovery and our exploration and our innovation can take place. So questions within the scope of human evolution, questions that are essentially a technology that allow us to draw insights. But there are many, many different kinds of questions. So let's look at these different kinds of questions because I think what's important here is that in order for us to exercise our curiosity, we have to learn to ask the right questions. During the, the, the pandemic, there was a great shortage of oxygen masks. So somebody came along and said, what if we take this snorkeling mask and we convert that snorkeling mask into an oxygen mask. We can repurpose this thing and help to save people's lives. I think that's remarkable. So when we use these kinds of open-ended questions, all of a sudden we begin to discover what is possible in the world. Now, Sakichi Toyoda, who was the founder of Toyota Industries, he came up with, this is over, over 100 years ago, by the way, he came up with a system that he called the five whys. And I think it's just fascinating. What he would do is, when he was faced with a problem, rather than doing the typical thing, which is to walk in and say, whose fault is this? Who did this? What happened? Right? What he would do is he would walk in and he would say, why? And then he would receive an answer and he would ask, why again? And he would receive the next answer and then, why again? And what he was doing was he was essentially going deeper and deeper to really discover the source of the problem. So let's take a look at how the five whys work. Let's look at global climate change and automobile emissions. 
So why is there climate change? Well, because of carbon emissions, of course. Well, why are there carbon emissions? Well, because we drive in cars from to, to and from work, school, etc. Why do we have to go to work or school? Well, because we need to have meetings and classes and do our work. Why do we have to have meetings and classes in the offices or in the school buildings because we don't have any alternative? And so, of course, the next question is, why don't we? And then the answer is, which, which is quite beautiful and fascinating, is let's use Zoom. And so by using these questions in this way, we're able to dig and innovate and discover in ways that we couldn't if we didn't use them. So I'm, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned about what is happening to our curiosity. And I'm concerned that if we lose our curiosity, we will lose the, the thing that makes us human beings. It's the essence of who we are. It's the essence of, of, our, of, the, of the freedom that we have to discover and, and enjoy the world around us. And I'm concerned because when we think about the knowns, the unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, if we look at what happens on social media, for example, I see more and more that people believe that they know everything. They believe that I have the right answer. I have the right answer because I have this particular set of information. This is what is known to me. And the other people who I disagree with, they don't have the information that I have. And so what's happening is that we, we are becoming sort of stubborn about this idea that we have unknowns. And that, in fact, there are unknown unknowns. May you always be curious about that which you don't know. Thank you.